to a lot of us, the B stands for budget in motherboard series like B450 and B550, but supposedly the B actually stands for business. I think it's a somewhat entertaining prospect. I mean, these are self-proclaimed gaming motherboards. And unless your job has you playing solitaire all day, do you really need this for business? <laughs> Welcome to Machines and More. I think as Ryzen 5000 availability is getting a little bit better since the launch late last year, it's a good time to start looking at some content uh, related to that. And I will be doing a couple of Ryzen 3000 versus 5000 comparisons here on the channel and some other comparisons for cooling on Ryzen 5000, just like we did with the 5600X. So go ahead and hit subscribe and that bell to get all the latest updates here. But today I did want to dive into mini ITX board selection a little more first. Now B450 boards are a good option now, as long as you have the BIOS update for Ryzen 5000 and plenty of boards now have that. But the B550 boards are still newer. And I think at least one of these two B550 ITX boards has a little bit more to offer. So let's compare these two boards side by side. This one here is the Gigabyte B550 ITX. The other one here is the ASUS B550 ITX, the Strix. Now, in the interest of providing information that is relevant for most users, I'm gonna focus on the features and differences that I think are worthwhile, and we'll figure out which B to assign to these two boards. I'll state upfront that CPU performance isn't a huge reason to choose one over the other. For the most part, VRMs, that's a lot of marketing at work. And unless you're looking to overclock a 5950X or a 3950X, there's not going to be a compelling reason to choose one over the other. I did a quick test with each board running the Ryzen 7 5800X on PBO with a curve optimizer setting of negative 20 for a minimum of 10 minutes, and it's really close. In terms of CPU vCore, you can see there's not a huge difference between the two boards. The ASUS does appear to give about 0.01 volts less than the Gigabyte. There are a few spikes beyond 1.4 volts, but nothing terribly concerning as a whole from either board. For all core clock frequencies with PBO and Curve Optimizer enabled, you're again looking at similar clock speeds from either board. Both land at around 4650 megahertz, and this is fairly good considering this is an all core workload and ignore the dips since that is from the Cinebench cycle restarting itself. The Gigabyte is marginally ahead, but it's not terribly important. Lastly, for CPU temps on the 5800X, the Gigabyte is consistently about a degree better, topping out at 81 degrees, while the ASUS puts the 5800X up to 82 degrees. Again, not a hugely important result, but we still do have to acknowledge that the Gigabyte is marginally better. As a whole, the Gigabyte appeared to perform a little better in Cinebench multi-core, but there is some variability from each run, um, and the scores reported here are from that final run after the 10 minute minimum cycle, so there is going to be some variation each time you run it. I realized that it would take hours to fully saturate the VRM temps, but I ran an additional 20 minutes and probed under the VRM heatsink, and the ASUS topped out at 50 degrees while the Gigabyte hit 42. At least from the quick test, there's nothing concerning at all for either board. You're not gonna get anywhere near the power rating limits of these VRMs without wildly overheating the power delivery, completely melting the stages first. But spec-wise, the Gigabyte has a better VRM setup consisting of a six plus two phase with 90 amp stages. So theoretically you have 720 amps, which again, total overkill. And the ASUS here, it features an A plus two phase with 50 amp power stages. And yes, on paper it is weaker, but even your high-end Ryzen 9 chips are gonna draw less than 200 amps, so it's not a big difference. What matters a little more is that the ASUS has a little fan, which some users may not like. And I know that on the X570 Strix ITX board, some folks have complained about the buzzy fan. And this Gigabyte has a completely passive setup. And when you combine that with better power stages along with lower utilization, I think you really do have to tip your hat in Gigabyte's direction. For me, the bigger and more important differences are this Gigabyte feels like a sturdier board that it just feels like a premium product. Oh, there's a lot of thermal mass here. 
It's got a thick motherboard backplate, an integrated I.O. shield, which is so much easier for ITX since you don't have to work the board in and out of a removable shield like the Strix has. Plus, you know, it just feels really nice to have an integrated shield. The Gigabyte board is heavier and overall the construction just inspires a little bit more confidence. And I think the construction on this board is absolutely on par with Gigabyte's X570 ITX Aorus board. The ASUS board, on the other hand, just feels more like a flimsier board. For the connectors, even though both boards have three case or CPU fan headers, the position and layout are different. The Gigabyte is all over the place. You got one for the CPU next to the power connector with the CPU power connector in a very difficult to access location after your build is set up. So good luck changing out coolers. And the case header isn't much easier to find either. It's right down here next to under the RAM slot. And there is a third mini header which requires an adapter cable that Gigabyte provides to get to a standard four pin connector. And that goes right over here. Not terribly easy to access, but not too bad either. By contrast, the ASUS's fan headers are extremely easy to access and they're in a great location. All three are right here at the top. CPU, pump, chassis fan. <laughs> in terms of the layout, the Gigabyte socket is about 11 millimeters higher than the ASUS board. And in cases like the NR200, that's a pretty significant difference in being able to use full 25 millimeter fans with certain coolers. This RAM is also set a little bit lower. And in general, I prefer ASUS's approach to the placement. Usually in all builds, your GPU is more or less in the same spot towards the bottom. So your lower limit is the same and cooler to GPU clearance is less of an issue due to the smaller coolers that SFF builders are actually able to use physically with their cases. So setting the components down a little bit lower gives a little more flexibility with things like case fans and cable management. IO wise, the Gigabyte board does not have a front USB-C header, but it does have five USB 3.2 type A headers, only one of which is Gen 2, the other four are Gen 1, and one rear USB 3.2 Gen 2 type C port. The Strix board does have the front type C USB 3.2 Gen 2 header. It has one less type A port at the back, but three of these are Gen 2, with one being Gen 1 and a 3.2 Gen 2 rear Type-C port. And additionally, a Type-C audio port. So that's kind of unique with this one. In terms of USB, I think the ASUS board wins that, uh, especially with the Type-C front header if you can use it. Both boards feature Wi-Fi 6 and 2.5G Ethernet. Not a big difference on that front, but I do like Gigabyte's Wi-Fi antenna more. Uh, it is magnetic, so it can attach to your case if yours has at least a steel frame. And I found that to be very helpful, especially if you move your case around a lot and just pop this on there, which actually for SFF is something that people do quite often. In terms of audio, on paper, the Realtek ALC1220 codec on the Gigabyte board is better than the S1220A on the Strix, but honestly, if you really care about audio, you should be running an external DAC anyway. One thing I do like about the B550 Strix audio setup is that it does away with a silly front audio dongle that is on the X570 Strix board. This one matters for custom loop builds. The temp probe header that is on the Strix board is a great feature because you can just plug any 10K probe onto it to monitor the coolant temp. One additional helpful feature is that both of these boards have the ability to flash the BIOS without a CPU. The Gigabyte's Q Flash Plus and ASUS's BIOS Flashback both accomplish the same thing which is helpful, especially if your board still needs updating to Ryzen 5000, which at this point still may be needed. However, in practice, I could not get the Strix board to update without first putting a CPU in. Now there is a fairly narrow use case for actually needing to update without the CPU, because typically the reason you would need to do that is if you have a new CPU on hand already. So this is not that bad of an issue. So, only the Gigabyte lives up to that claim of being able to update without the CPU. The general expectation is that Ryzen 5000 is the end of the road for AM4, so beyond this current generation, there's not so much value in there, but it is still worth mentioning that feature. I typically prefer Gigabyte's BIOS to ASUS, but 
both are actually some of the better ones to begin with, and there's not a huge amount of difference there. For storage, both of these have four SATA 6 gigabit per second connectors, and both support RAID 0, 1, and 10. Now for the gigabyte board, the front M.2 slot is super baffling. Now it goes together like this. You've got your drive that slots in normally, and then you've got this heat sink with a thermal pad. So far, so good. And uh, this thing slides onto here, and that screws down, right? And that's all okay. And this doesn't touch the heat pipe assembly. That's okay. Um, but here's the weird part. Then normally you would put this huge chunk of metal and over this, but that doesn't actually touch that heat sink at any point. There's a huge gap and effectively you've cut off airflow to the heat sink underneath. And now this thing is insulating this more than anything else because the M.2 heat sink doesn't touch it or the heat sink assembly. And so I have no idea what this huge chunk of metal is doing other than serving as additional thermal material for the VRM and chipset heat sink. So my guess is that Gigabyte didn't want this board cooling, heating up the M.2 drive, but you know, this is still going to cook your drive for extended read and write cycles. So if you care about M.2 thermals, then just set this chunk aside. Your board cooling doesn't really need it. Probably the biggest des single design flaw on this otherwise incredible board. Now the M.2 heatsink on these tricks is pretty typical and it doesn't show the same odd design. Just a thermal pad and thermal material here. And you can, this is, there's a lot of airflow around here. So not a whole different uh, than most good M.2 heatsinks on that front. Similar to the fan headers, the Strix has intentional placement of the RGB headers towards the top of the board, right here. And the Aorus is a bit more obscure with the ARGB and RGB headers being split by the RAM slots and not exactly easy to access. The Gigabyte board does have RGB on the back of the board, while the ASUS doesn't have any lighting at the back, if that matters to you. Finally, the Strix has a debug LED, something that's pretty helpful, especially to new builders, if something goes wrong in post or your system won't post at all. All right, so there's a lot to digest, but I'll go ahead and sum it all up. Compared to the X570 ITX boards from their own respective brands, the Gigabyte B550 is a huge improvement over the X570 in many ways. And personally, I don't see why you would choose the Aorus X570 over this one, because this one is that good. And unfortunately, the B550 ASUS is clearly still a notch below the X570 Strix, at least in terms of power delivery and overall look and feel. I really like the Gigabyte board, and when it came out, it was priced way better than the ASUS was, almost 30 US dollars ahead. But since then, the price has shuffled around a little bit, and now the ASUS is only about $10 more. But of course, that could change at any moment. Now, despite that smaller price advantage between these two, I still like the Gigabyte. I think it's the better board overall, better build, component quality, and features all passive cooling. And for most SFF builders, I think it's the better choice, even though it does have a few quirks. The ASUS has a few specialty features though such as the USB-C front header if you need or want it. And I think the strength in this board is the easy layout and that debug LED and the position of the CPU that yields a little bit more clearance. If you're a new builder deciding between these two, I would go ahead and recommend the Strix, but just be advised, it doesn't exactly feel like a premium product. On the Strix, for me, the B and B550 is squarely budget. And for the Aorus, this B is business. Not that you should ask your boss to buy you one for work, but because this board is all business. So there you have it. Hope this comparison was helpful. Please like and subscribe, and let me know which one you would choose down in the comments. Thanks for watching today, and I'll see you again soon.